If you have your Bibles, please open them up to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15 will be starting in verse 14 in just a moment. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Whether we know what you're doing or not, we always know for certain that you are working all things together for good. Lord, as you've selected this passage for this day, we can be confident, Father, that there's something something that you will say that will bring glory to you, that will please and bless and honor you, Lord, something that's needful for us to hear and also a blessing. We also thank you, Lord, that you've told us the truth is that apart from you doing it, uh, we won't know it. We won't hear. We won't receive. We won't be able to trust and see you work. So we just come yet again and always before you in faith, Lord, to ask for your will to be done, for your glory and good pleasure. And Father, for the edification and the strengthening of the saints, Lord, your church, for which you sent your Son, you bled and died and rose again, that we might have, Lord, all that your heart desires. So we thank you for these things. Do so in faith. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So don't shout it out, and I'm not going to take like a lot of time to explain it at this point. But just want to ask you, by means of a reminding question, we're in the book of Romans. What's the theme? What's, what's the big idea of the book of Romans? Oh, just kind of put that into your head for a moment. Uh, then ask yourself this question, or answer it as I ask, I guess, would be more accurate. Who's writing it? We know the Lord, but through whom? Well, where was he? What were the circumstances? Well, if we have this information available, it must be helpful to us. And then, what was the status of the, the people in Rome? Were they unbelievers? Were they, what were they exactly? Well, we've asked a lot of questions. We'll seek some answers here, but most importantly, we'll trust the Lord to find out why it really matters to you, to me, to us today as a church. Now, the change up in the letter, and it's, it's helpful for me to remind myself that wasn't broken down into chapters and verses, and I spent some time just thinking in prayer, and I, I don't have the Lord's answer uh, to this yet, but I wondered how it worked for that church in Rome because this group of believers was, was a church. They were blood-bought believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You get a letter in the mail. You all come here with your own Bible, right? And if you don't, we give you one. But they had one letter. How did they get together? Did they break it down? I mean, did they, read, did they make copies, which was an expensive proposition at that time? But that church had been given a letter and the Lord obviously chose this letter for all of his churches. And then he says this, and we're going to start to marry up some passages today with some things we've already looked at and we're going to understand why and how the Lord works. And we begin this process in Romans chapter 15, verse 14, where we read, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Some translations take the word admonish and say instruct, but the most literal case in this example is admonish, which means to warn. And so what our brother is saying by the leading of the Holy Spirit is like, here's some things that I know are true about you since you're a believer in Christ because God is in you because you've been positioned in him because you have everything he says you have, all things that pertain to life and godless, uh, godliness. I could characterize it this way. I'm confident concerning you that you're full of goodness. Positioned in Christ, you can't have any more 
goodness, filled with all knowledge. And we've spoken of that previously. We're able to, as we talked about in 1 John, know everything that's important, that pertains to life and godliness. We have the anointing that God has given us, His Spirit, and we'll talk about one of His ministries in just a moment, able to admonish one another, warn one another. It's interesting to me that the Lord put that in this book also. It's like, hey, part of the good things that you have as a brother or sister in the Lord, as a part of the body of Christ, you have this very good ability to warn other people. Let me ask you a question. What would you warn if you boiled it down to just one thing that characterized every other thing that could be harmful? What would you warn a brother or sister in the Lord? Now, it's not the focus of this passage, and a little spoiler alert, it foreshadows something that comes up next week as we finish up the study. There is a warning there. But again just to kind of preempt and think about it, what's the, what's the one thing that shows up so many different ways that's going to cause a problem for the children of God? What's going to take a church out? Paul's not focused on it at the moment because he's confident. He said, I know you guys can do that. So presumably there would be opportunities in a God-honoring way to do that. And then he says in verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points. And you could go through the book of Romans and there's some very bold statements where people are called into accountability. Think Romans chapter 2 where it's laid out in very clear language in the following chapters what we are in and of ourselves. We've all sinned and fallen short. He writes extremely boldly and declares who we are in Christ and what we have, the situation with Israel, right? So here's the thing. Paul, if you know that these are brothers and sisters and you know that they have the Spirit of God, and they already are an established church, and they can do all these things, why did you do it? Was it necessary? And that really brings us to the main point of the things we'll look at today, and we see it mentioned next. Our brother continues, as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. Now, we're going to see in a little bit that Paul understands he's not doing anything by himself. And he's saying, no, as consistent with the gift that God has given me as an apostle, Paul could say, I am doing what we'll see in a moment. I know the Lord wants me to do, but now let's put that aside and focus. What is the Lord telling Paul to do? I want to remind you. Rome was an established church. On the day of Pentecost, there were believing Israelites, right, who saw the manifestation of the Spirit, heard the speaking of tongues. They heard the proclamation of the gospel. And although it's not stated, we think at least there was an opportunity there for those pilgrims at the feast. Perhaps they took back the gospel. Maybe some of them were part of the 3,000. The word went out all the way to Rome, which was a good ways away. Travel then was not like travel now. However, it got there. It didn't get there by Paul. He had not yet been to Rome. The gospel had gone out. A church was formed. Jewish converts to Jesus Gentile converts to Jesus, all together, one in Christ, believing in the Lord, full of all goodness, has the Spirit of God, the Spirit's moving. And the Lord said, here's what that established church needs. They need the gospel. What do you mean? Does it challenge you a little bit, brother or sister, to think about this? No, the gospel, we're still in that mode. We give the gospel to someone when they start out. And then we go on to the deeper things. Well, the gospel, when we think rightly, as we've, well, I'm reminding you again. Well, it's more than just 
the portion of God's word that tells us what is necessary for salvation. It's all of God's word because in context, everything God wants us to know is good news when understood. And that's really what we see in Romans. He told us, like, I'm going to declare the gospel to you there in chapter 1. And then he launches into what we now know as the next, well, 16 chapters, all of it good news. And Paul now says at the be- close to the end, I know that what the Lord is having me to do is to remind you, established church, of these things. Now here's a question. Why would the Lord have us do that? I think one of the summary statements is because he knows that we need that. What? We need to have the things mentioned in Romans 12 brought back to our mind. Yes, but more than that, we need to have everything in God's word brought back to our remembrance. The process works this way. You study the word, right? You can't remember something that you haven't ever heard, you haven't ever learned. So you study the word knowing that it's all needed. So you are going through Bible studies. And this is probably what you've understood by now if you've gone through Bible studies. Like, oh, I don't know, you know, book of Zechariah, I've been through that study. I don't need that. Well, here's the thing. Did you get it all the first time? If you've been through a Bible study twice and you've been seeking the Lord, you already know that answer. No, because you always get more every time the Lord brings you someplace. But what about the things you got the first time? Paul said by the grace given to him, operating under the full inspiration and control of the Holy Spirit. I'm doing this as a means of reminding. And and Paul's not alone in this. Our brother, the Apostle Peter, also wrote to the church. He said, I would stir you up by means of a reminder. A really helpful study to reinforce this on your own is just look up the word remember and its variants and how often the Lord uses them. And then remember this. One of the primary stated ministries of the Holy Spirit, one of the ways he has chosen to reveal how he works was given to us by Jesus. When Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit is given, he will bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. That's exactly what's happening. I don't know if there was new ground in Romans for the church in Rome. I suppose that there might have been. But Paul says, no, I'm, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. Now, this is causing us to think. And is that a good thing? Well, the Lord says in his word, come, let us reason together. Jesus said, think about it as he's addressing during teaching. Why would I need to have the things that the Lord has previously told me brought back to my mind? Well, because if he doesn't do it, I probably won't, to be honest with you. Because apart from him, I can do nothing. And more than that, because if I'm to stay abiding on him, abiding in him, focused on him in faith, The only way I can do that is to have his word here. Earlier during announcements, I likened the circumstances of life, which are only getting more intense, as bombs going off. You get the phone call. A loved one has just passed away in a horrific accident. Boom, it's like a bomb going off. The doctor's diagnosis, out of the clear blue, you're feeling good, and it's, well, it's terminal. Boom, bomb going off. And our tendency is to put our focus on those. And then we enter into the downward spiral of circumstances. The only lift out of that is, well, what's a main idea for the book of Romans? The just shall live by faith. Chapter 1. This new relationship, all of the goodness of God available and promised to us, only is made real when I'm focused in trust 
on his word as it applies to the circumstance. Oh, I just don't know that I'm going to have enough for tomorrow. Oh, well, it, all of a sudden this just came to my mind. Sufficient for the day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm just so unsettled. I, I just don't know how this is going to work out. Oh, wait a minute. God made me a promise by which I become a partaker of his nature. He'll keep me in perfect peace as I keep my mind stayed on him because I trust in him. Not because I know about his word, because I trust in him. Isaiah 26, 3. It's getting a lot of traction nowadays in our fellowship. And we'll probably get much more. I have learned experientially that by myself, I'm not able to bring everything to remembrance, but I have experienced his goodness as I look to him in faith and to say, Lord, what do you need me to know here? That something he has previously taught me is now back in my mind and it becomes the life-saving focus of the moment. Life-saving in this, my relationship with Jesus, that's eternal life. Not Todd dealing with the circumstances as I think best able. How often is it when we get one of these, well, tragedies and even the, the, well, the worldly blessings where it takes our focus and we go to deal as we think, that oh, this is what I have to do. Well, I'd like to do that. I, I don't know about fellowship because I got to handle this. Oh, I, I don't know about spending time with the Lord because I got a real crisis. I love something a brother said so many years ago. It was at a conference where Marty and I attended. He said this so clearly. He said, if we spend all of our time putting out brush fires, the enemy will light so many of them, you will never be connected to your main ministry, which is your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Once Satan, who watches you and his minions, who studies you, says, here's a demonstrated pattern in how this one works. This is the circumstance that will take their focus off of the Lord. Generate the circumstance. Watch them go because they'll leave the things of the Lord to go after taking care of this because that's what a good responsible person does. Brothers and sisters, there's an opportunity to see it. Watch. We live together in a manner of speaking. We learn of one another. You'll see this in me. I'll see it in you. When I don't see it in myself, it's an opportunity for you to say, whoa, warning. Danger, Will Robinson. Todd, are you focused on the Lord or are you focused on the circumstances? Thank you. I was focused on those circumstances. Oh, that would have only gotten worse. Thank you for the, well, instruction or warning. Yeah, that's why the translations vary. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Lord, for sending a brother. And when you're not there, the Holy Spirit brings us. Oh, wait a minute. It all works together, brothers and sisters, reminding the things are necessary to have our current focus on the necessary truth to live the life of faith. So for whatever the circumstances were in Rome, I don't know, but I know a little bit about history. Rome was a tough place to be a Christian and it went through different cycles of difficulty as we've all learned a little bit about. We see that, well, the Lord was using Paul to edify the church. Now, Paul has a perspective that he also shares and as we hear about our brother's perspective, we're going to be able to take away some personal applications for how we individually serve in the body. So Paul has already said, you know, I, I'm writing this to you to remind you. Paul must have understood, hey, they're church, they're brothers and sisters. They must know some of these things. I'm doing it because of the grace, the unearned gift given to me by God. Paul was an apostle. He says in verse 16 that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot there, but there's something else that I think is at least possible as 
knowing many of you study and we look at different translations, you might have seen a, a different word introduced. And I know that there's been a pitfall. So it's an opportunity for me to not only uh, explain, but maybe give a warning here. And I think I can best do that by putting the verse up on the screen here. And we've got it in a different translation. Brother will put it up here. Romans 15, 16 in the ESV and other translations will do it this way too. State this verse that way. Paul says, in effect, hey, I've written to you guys to remind you in order to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Again, there were non-Jewish believers in the church in Rome. In the priestly service, hey, there's the, that's not in this translation. Maybe not. But the underlying words bear this out. In the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now here's the warning up front. I'm going to state it quickly, then we're going to move on to what a Bible student should see from this. The warning is, and some others have done, they have taken this one verse, forget the whole two, three witnesses, to say, hey, for us to be a church, we need priests in the New Testament, like priests in the Old Testament. Get a guy up front who's wearing some special garbs and doing a thing, you know, in a ritual, and they ignore a lot of scripture. You know, they're, they're offering sacrifices on an altar in front of a building. And, but wait a minute, Jesus was offered once the final sacrifice for all. Notwithstanding, we've got this verse where Paul says priestly service, so we need priests in the church. But the Lord tells us that well, in Christ, we're as, we're as like priests ourselves, right? The priesthood of the believer. We don't need a, a go-between. But yet, our brother Paul, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, uses this. It's the only place it occurs. So that's always, that's always a fantastic mystery when the Lord reveals that. Lord, there's got to be something special. Show me what you want me to know about this. And we will in a moment. But let's just kind of look at this now and say, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The offering of the Gentiles is the same as the offering. You offer, you know, everything, Romans 12, when you come to the Lord. And in Christ, it is sanctified or set apart, and it is by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is kind of a way of Paul saying everything that the Lord has given him to do and the places he has gone to take the gospel and people have come to Christ is so that people would be set apart in the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't, I'm not dodging this word. He used the word priestly. We're coming back to it. I just wanted to make you aware of it now and warn you, don't think that this one verse means, hey, we need to change up the liturgy of the meeting here as others have. And I think that's the reason why some translations don't put it in there because they're, they might be a little gun shy. It can't be certain on that because you'd have to ask the individual translators on that. Let's go to verse 17 right now because there's some more information that we need to get under our belt so we can come back to the concept. In verse 17 we read, Therefore I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. Reason to glory make visible God's character and honor God. Both of those are applications and they work. How is that, Paul? Well, Paul says in verse 18, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. Now, he's going to expand on that, but right there we should just understand that Paul isn't thinking that it's up to him to do something. Paul is now going to state, hey, everything that has happened through my ministry has been accomplished by the Lord through me. Remember what Paul has written to the church in Galatians, the second chapter. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, here in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Another way of saying, it's the Holy Spirit who is doing the works in Paul. And Paul's there, obviously, but he knows apart from, God, apart from Christ, he can do nothing. So he's well, explaining it 
to the church in Rome. Maybe he's reminding them of that. As Christians, we should know that once we've learned it anyway. So in verse 18 again we read, For I will not dare speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. There's a comma there, so I want to interject this. Wouldn't it be great if all Christians who had any kind of a public ministry would confine themselves to that? That's what should happen. In word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. Now, there's something here that's still a little puzzling, and I'm... I don't bring up the puzzling things to leave you puzzled, but to point out in this, Paul's going to tie it all together, but yet not Paul, the Holy Spirit. In that church in Rome, there were Jewish believers. Remember chapter 2 and and elsewise? But there were also non-Jewish believers. But he keeps putting this emphasis here on making the Gentiles obedient. Verse 19, Paul says of the things the Lord had done through him, and it Well, it is recorded in many places in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, Illyricum is a a, a area geographically north of Macedonia. Spend some time looking at it in your Bible map. That was a huge chunk of real estate in those days to travel you know, by land, by sea, over mountain ranges, all those places. Paul's just saying, the Lord has led me to all of these places to preach the gospel of God. And he says, you know, that the Gentiles, you know, priestly service that the Gentiles might come to the Lord continues on in verse 20. And so I made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Now, that's a wonderful thought, obviously. It's the word of God, but it bears a little bit more explanation. Is Paul saying the only pleasing and acceptable ministry in the sight of God is to go where nobody has been ever before and to bring the gospel out. Well, automatically you'd have a little bit of a problem with that uh, explanation because, well, wait a minute, he's ministering to people where the gospel has gone before. By letter, he hasn't been there physically, right? Right? Or is he saying, which I believe is correct, hey, I'm just explaining what I understand is my unique position by the grace of God as an apostle. God has used me and directed me to go these places. And we have the account, right? If Paul wanted to go to one place, Bithynia, the Spirit said, no, no, we're not going for there. We actually got a call to go to Macedonia. Paul knew how he was being used by the Lord, his part of the body of Christ. He was an apostle. He was chosen by Jesus to bring the good news to the Gentiles. That's what Jesus chose him for. Now, application. Paul's explaining his position, but it's extremely helpful, brothers and sisters, to know what the Lord has called you to do. How do you do that? Well, you ask him. The Lord will tell you. It's a step of faith, but his word says that. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask of me. I will reveal it abundantly. Lord, show me in a way that you want me to understand what is my part in the body of Christ. It's not by a spiritual gift inventory or a committee assigning you something. There's one head of the body. And he puts the members in as he pleases, the scripture tells us. Paul is just demonstrating this in his testimony. I am led to say, hey, you know what? You can effectively minister to others from the foundation of knowing your place. You're not trying to be something you're not or hoping that what you're doing is what you're supposed to be. Paul knew, it's like, no, this this is me. So when he says in verse 20, again, So I've made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named. He's just saying, 
I'm in full agreement with what the Lord has called me to do. Lest I should build on another man's foundation. One more quick addition and we could have several. How do we know that it's not, we're not supposed to be saying, no, you only go where nobody else has been? Well, because the Lord says, and he said through Paul, hey, one plants, one waters. Right? Paul was a planter, apparently. He was used by the Lord to bring the gospel to, to see those churches founded. And he directed others. Hey, you, you need to appoint elders there in Titus. The job of elders, teaching, right? Well, isn't that like building on... Oh, Paul's just simply stating, I know what the Lord has called me to do. And then he has a scripture from, well, the printed Bible of his time that clearly the Lord used to confirm to him and he's using it to explain to others. Verse 21, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. Now there's a parallel to that in Isaiah. We're going to look at it in a moment, but I want to get a little bit more information so we can see how the Lord has, has given us this kind of a clue and then as we seek him, he's going to, well, open our understanding to see the big picture of what's going on here. Paul says in verse 22, by the Holy Spirit, for this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. In other words, you know, because the Lord had me in these other areas from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, all this great amount... I've been working there, so I haven't been able to come to you. He knew they were an established church, but he knew that fellowship with established churches were not off limits either. But now, Paul says, at his current time, no longer having a place in these parts, apparently the work that the Lord had directed had, was finished for him, and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Wow, there's... There's something that's helpful just to note and maybe make personal application. The Lord offers so many good things, right? It's not bad to have fellowship with these people over here, but what if it took you off the direction that the Lord had you at the moment? One thing is needed, and that is to know where the Lord has you. And again, ministering from a position of certainty. He said, man, I've desired all these years to come to you. Verse 23, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, more on that in a moment, he, because he mentions it twice, might be critical. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first I may enjoy your company for a while. Paul, Paul was mission-focused, and somehow the mission involves Spain. We'll talk about Spain in a moment. But he said, you know, I would go right through and by Rome on my way to Spain, and I wanted to see him. So man, if that would be the Lord's will, that would be a good thing. That's kind of Paul's plan. I'll be in Rome, and then from Rome, I'll you know, go through to Spain and there'll be an opportunity for the brothers and sisters to assist in the Lord's work because it's going to be obvious that the Lord is doing it and who doesn't want to be a part of the Lord's work as he leads, right? So again in verse 24, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first I may enjoy your company, fellowship for a while. But now... That's later, because now I got a mission, Paul says, and he describes it. I'm going to Jerusalem to minister, serve the saints. The church began in Jerusalem. And, well, you know, wherever people put their faith in Jesus, hard times follow. They're guaranteed. Again, this is the, the shepherd's way of moving the flock, right? Difficult times that we might have our peace and our rest in the Lord and not in the world. So the saints in Jerusalem were going through it. Hard, difficult times. Verse 26, For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For 
if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, so what's going on? Hey, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, we have clear information that a collection was being taken up by the church for the church. Those who had were helping out those who don't have. We just studied that in 1 John about loving one another. How can we say we love one another if we have the world's goods and we see our brothers or sisters in need and don't give to them? Well, you can't actually. But in this case, as we read in Acts 2.42 you know, and, and following, they had all things in common, nor did anybody say anything was their own. Hey, that's when the love of Christ is unbridled. People are looking to the Lord. The Lord is moving freely uh, through his people. It was happening here. And Paul was a part of it. He was the guy, if you remember the passages, he said, okay, you guys have secured this offering. You couldn't just wire it or FedEx it. Somebody had to physically carry the stuff. And Paul knew the dangers. He said, you select a couple people from among you. They'll go with me we'll, and we'll bring the relief. So that was the more urgent need. Paul had a desire, a desire to be with the brothers and sisters that he had not met. But he saw a critical need that was more important, and that's the mind of Christ, looking not only out for your own interests, but considering the needs of others more important than yourself. Clearly, the Spirit is working through Paul. So Paul says in verse 28, Therefore, when I perform this and have sealed to them this fruit, when I've dropped off the offering, the needed relief and supplies, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Okay, there's the second time. So we've got to talk Spain for a moment. Okay, so you might be like I am, not really clear on geography till you look at the map and stuff, but in a general direction, you know Jerusalem and where they're at. If you headed across the continent in a generally westerly direction, your last stop before you hit the ocean would be Spain. And Paul is clearly thinking, got to take the gospel to Spain, right? There's Gentiles, non-Jewish people there who have not heard the gospel. What's going on? Keep a marker here and let's make our way to the left to the book of Isaiah uh, and look at that one parallel passage, Isaiah chapter 52. We'll back up just a couple verses to get a little bit of context. But look at these things with some curiosity and prayerfully study the Lord. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit used this in Paul's life to confirm his message. He still works the same way, brothers and sisters. So in this passage, spoken and then maybe written by the prophet Isaiah, right, to the Israelites, we get a prophecy, a future foretelling of the coming of the Lord Jesus here in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. God says through his prophet, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many, as many were astonished at you, so his visage, the way he appeared here, was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. Right? This is the passage that talks about the things that Jesus endured on the cross. He was beaten and tortured so badly that scripture says... Hey, the way he looked, man, this was more damaged than anybody else. His form more than the sons of men. But after all of this damage, after the ordeal on the cross, afterwards of Jesus we're told, so he shall sprinkle many nations. It's an interesting word as you look at it. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. After Jesus goes through this, well, there's going to be new information and people are going to receive it. Paul said, 
I make it my aim to preach the gospel where it hadn't been before. That was a passage that was referred to in his letter to Rome's or or the counterpart. A little more clearly, you're in Isaiah. Go to, to chapter 66, please. And at the end of the book, we're going to read what God says is going to happen. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 18. The Lord says, for I know their works. To get the tie-in, you've got to read what comes before. And their thoughts. And it shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Now, the Lord wrote that to the Israelites. And they knew that they were a chosen nation, but if they would have read and believed all of their Bible, they would have known that God was using them as his witnesses to everybody else. They weren't always down with that, even so in New Testament times. Hey, you remember what the apostles asked Jesus in Acts, in the opening of Acts, just before he rose again from the dead? Lord, at this time, Is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They knew about that, that there was a time coming when Israel wouldn't be under Rome's power or anybody else's. They knew those prophecies. And Jesus told them something. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Do you know the last one? Amen. The ends of the earth. Now, I don't know what they knew. I know what historians say they thought of as the ends of the earth. If you're in the European continent, the earth ended when you hit the ocean, basically. Right? So, God has said, no, I'm going to gather all nations, verse 18, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, And those among them who escape, I will send to the nations. Now the sign, hey, the New Testament tells about that. Here's the sign. The virgin shall be with child. Oh, that's the birth of Jesus. There's a sign. Hey, there were many signs, but that's one clearly from the book of Isaiah. But the Lord continues here. I will send to the nations. Then he says to Tarshish. Tarshish is the name of Spain before it was Spain. Paul would have known Spain as Tarshish. He would have known, and so would every other Bible-believing Christian of the day, hey, God's going to send the message all the way out to the end to Spain or Tarshish. And he mentions some others here. Let's read a little bit more. And pull and lewd and draw the bow and two ball and javan to the coastlands afar off who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory. I make it my aim to preach the gospel where it hasn't been. He had biblical precedence and I would imagine the Holy Spirit impressed this on Paul. Hey, this is where we got to go. Now there's an interesting thing by means of application. We'll look at this more in a moment. We don't know if Paul ever got there. He went to Jerusalem. He's arrested. He's carried off to Rome, a prisoner. He goes through a couple imprisonments. He gets to Rome. There's no record of Paul making it to Spain. I think the application is this. We all have a mission. The church has always had a mission that we can be actively at until the day the Lord takes us out. You're not going to get it done. There's no room for kicking back and say, oh, I'm bored, nothing to do. Paul doesn't demonstrate that. Remember what Paul said to the church in Corinth? Hey, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Jesus was always about the Father's business. There's the goal. One of the things that the Lord certainly must be accomplishing if we expect him to answer the prayer we pray, make us the church you want us to be, We're going to be about the Father's business, how important it is to know. Paul knew his part. Again, I encourage you, seek. Know what the Lord has called you to do. You'll have, well, you'll have the rest of your life to be working at it. So at the end of verse 19, the Lord says, 
they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And in verse 20, then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations. Remember that verse? Paul said, my priestly service. It's kind of that picture, like a priest brought an offering. Paul knew what the Lord was using him to do. I'm being used by the Lord to bring the gospel. And so in a, a metaphor, a figurative way of speaking, it's like through the gospel, they're being offered to the Lord and sanctified and set apart. That's what he's referring to. And it's kind of interesting as we go just a little bit further. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations, that would include the Gentiles, on horses and chariots and in litters, on mules, on camels. They're going to come all kinds of ways. To my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And then it's just kind of interesting. We're going to end here, verse 21. I will also take some of them for priests and Levites. I don't know the fullness of what Paul thought without the Lord saying, but I know there's biblical precedent and his referencing back to Isaiah said, hey, 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 where the Lord had him focusing and thinking. Well, that's kind of interesting, but it gets even clearer. So from uh, the book of Isaiah, let's make our way back to the New Testament, stopping in the book of Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, we're going to see the brothers in action here. And, well, you know, the gospel goes out. And you know what happens? It's been said of Paul, wherever he went, there was either a riot or a revival or both. You know, just like Jesus when he spoke the truth, when he was here in the flesh. Hey, some people received it. Some people really resisted and opposed and got violently adversarial against him. Well, Jesus tells every one of his followers, it's going to be the same way for you. I'm summarizing many verses. They hated you, they're going to hate me. Don't marvel when the world hates you, right? So what's happening? The gospel's going out. The Spirit's leading. The Spirit's speaking through Paul and the brothers. And there's opposition. So here in Acts chapter 13, let's get a little bit of context. Verse 42 so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. The people who should have received the word were hating it. The people who never heard the words like, oh, I've got a hope. I can be chosen in the Lord. He sent his son for me. All those things and more, no doubt, begged for it. Boy, it was none of you this close your eyes and bow your head and slip up your hand kind of thing here. You know, invite somebody to the church and we'll give you a toaster and a coffee cup. No, it's the power of God through his word. They begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They were people who knew their hopelessness. They were people prepared by the Holy Spirit. So in verse 43 we read, Now when the congregation had broken up many of the Jews and devout proselytes or converts... Uh, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Yikes. But, verse 45, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, dishonoring. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the words of God should be spoken to you, speaking to the Jews, first. That's what Jesus said. It's first to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. They knew what the Lord was doing with them. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, look, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul's mind at that time was Tarshish, Spain. That's <laughs> where the earth ends for us. So making our way back to Romans, but stop in chapter one. Look how this started out. Romans chapter one 
speaking, oh man, it's so hard for me just to jump in here. I'll, I'll jump in verse three. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, Romans 1, 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has been born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, verse five, through him, Jesus, we have received grace, an undeserved gift, and apostleship, his specific calling in the body of Christ for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Making your way back to Romans 15. Hey, Paul started out with that. Right? He knew what the Lord was using him to do. And he's telling him. He's given him his, his philosophy of ministry, which isn't his philosophy, but the Lord's. It's the Lord's calling, his plan, and his purpose. And even in that, he's setting an example. Jesus knew what he was called to do. He was constantly bombarded with people who thought they knew what Jesus should do. But he would set his face like a flint, a stone, immovable according to the Lord's purpose for him. He only did that which pleased the Father. To do that, you have to know what the Father is calling you to do. So, Verse 29, we read, but Paul says to the church in Rome, I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel, the good news of Christ. How can you know that? Because Paul knows if he's going to be there, the Lord is going to send him and it's going to accomplish everything the Lord wants him to do. No, hey, let's try this and see how it works out kind of thing. Now I beg you, brethren, verse 30, through the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe some new information here, and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Paul knew what he was called to do, and he knew that the Lord was the one who did it, but he also knew how it worked. You got to ask. And that word strive, it, it contains the, the root of which we get the English word agonize. Hey, come and agonize in prayer with me. I just, this was really a personal kind of reminder and maybe conviction or direction for me, maybe for you too. I was just like, you know why people don't pray more? Because it's hard. I know why we don't have more because we don't ask. Right? And, and the Lord says, sometimes you've got to keep asking. It's a faith move, right? The just shall live by faith. But, but the outcome is a guarantee. It's not a maybe. It's a I will do it. You keep asking until I do. Sometimes you're working at it. Now, we have a perfect example of someone in agony praying the Lord Jesus for the Lord's will. Went through some tough times. It didn't stop him. But man, what if when... I don't know, I don't feel like praying. It doesn't take much to stop today's Christians, right? of which I'm one. Uh, I don't by any means count myself differently. I kind of remind myself this. Right? It's like, wow, why don't you strive? Why don't you agonize with me? Why don't you keep at it even if it hurts <laughs> until what God has told you is accomplished? Hey, I, I'm just going to wonder together with your brothers and sisters, might the Lord be telling us something? Has he shown us what he wants to do? Has he shown us what means he will use to accomplish it? It's not a works program. It's a faith program. God says, ask, I'll do it. You keep asking until I do it. Well, and we just get this human perspective. You strive together with me in prayers to God for me. I don't believe Paul had any expectation it was going to happen any other way that I might be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. A little bit more on deliverance from the unbelievers next week, I think. But we should recognize that's the one source that always comes through. It was who Paul were experiencing there in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas, when they said, okay, you, you heard, you don't accept it, you don't believe. They were the ones causing the trouble always. How do you get delivered from them? And it was also Paul who, who reminds us, who the Lord used to teach us, they're not the root cause. They're not the, 
the cause. They're the agents. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, the powers and principalities. And those same powers and principalities don't believe God's word either. Right? And it takes an active adversarial stance against you. They're, they will become your enemies. Oh no, we're done. No, you pray. That's what the Lord is telling us. That I may be delivered, verse 31, from those in Judea who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. It wasn't just about praying to save my bacon. It was also praying that what he already knew he was supposed to do would go the way the Lord wants it to do. Ever been in the situation where like, you pray until you know what the Lord wants, then you take over from there? That's not the model put forth. You pray at the beginning, the middle of the day. You, you pray without ceasing, actually. Because it keeps our focus on the Lord. Praying is like communication. It's abiding. It's the one channel the Lord works through. Our mental focus, our communication. It's relationship. Whether it's out loud, whether it's internal. That my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. It's really interesting, right? I mean, we talk about knowing the will of God. Is it God's will that anyone should perish? No, the word says it explicitly. It's not his will that anyone should perish. Well, then how do people come to the Lord? Sometimes you say, hey, all are going to come to Jesus. That's true. But it's also true that we're supposed to pray for all men everywhere. It's something the Lord's been moving me personally is more fruit. I'm praying for more fruit, a lot, right? I don't know if I'm praying enough, right? And that's not about a works thing or something. I just know this. He's leading. It's what he wants. I pray until it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. However he counts fruit. I kind of have learned long ago to count my fruit by what's already been described as obedience to the faith. Right? I want to see more people come to the Lord. I know that there are going to be more that come in. Paul wrote previously in this gospel till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. I don't know how many more, but I know prophetically at this time that things get darker and darker and, and fewer and fewer. But yet, we keep praying. So again in verse 32 as we finish up here today, we read again, reminder that I may come to you with joy by the will of God. And that was to always go together when we abide and may be refreshed together with you. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Well, what a great place to end up. But how does that happen? Hey, let me remind you. Let's go back to last week here and look at verse 13 again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I trust that the Lord has singled out something to you. Maybe it's new. Maybe he reminded you of it. Maybe you have other situations in your life right now that are just so large that it's drawing your attention away. And you need, well, you need what the Lord knows you need. You need to seek him. You need to say, Father, what is it Please bring to my remembrance or lead me into your truth. Maybe I haven't learned this before or certainly not the fullness. But if we're going to experience these things that were clearly God's will for that church and this church, the God of peace be with you all, that the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing by the power of the Holy Spirit that you abound. You have to have God's word that you're trusting. So I'm going to pray right now as we end up today that we would all hear specifically the thing that you need right now and that you would put your full trust in that. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you to be reminded I only know a fraction of what you know how often I need to be reminded. But I do know this. Lord, if, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And I thank you that you do. Lord, I thank you that you bring to our remembrance. And I'm praying for my brothers and sisters and myself, whether it's new information or information you previously told us, Lord, put our focus on the thing, the one item, Lord, that your spirit knows we need today. 
Lord, that we might taste and see your goodness and remember that again anew, that we might know your peace in the midst of trials, your guidance in the midst of uncertainty. Lord, see your fruit in a very dark and fruitless world. Lord, we don't want to limit you to one thing. So we know to pray for the fullness of your will as well. For you to have your perfect way. And Lord, that we walk with you in faith. And that it becomes evident, Lord. The peace, the joy, and the abounding hope that you've made available to all of us in your Son. Your will again, we ask, thanking you in faith for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand and sing his praises?